A little bit over a year ago, I find my, found myself watching a clip of John Cleese on YouTube. I don't know how this happened, but uh, who here knows who John Cleese is? Monty Python, you are the blessed, and the rest of you have some catching up to do. <laughs> but John Cleese is a Brit British comedian, and uh, he, as most British comedians are, he's a little bit edgy. I'd show you the clip, but it wouldn't work. So let me tell you what he was talking about. He was frustrated with people who seemed to be so lacking in self-awareness, so, well, stupid, as he put it, that they didn't even realize it. And he, he talked about this at some length, and he talked about a study he had found that talked about this, and I thought, he, is, he can't be making this up. So I went and found the study. Let me read you the title of this study unskilled and unaware of it. How difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence leads to self-inflated assessments by Justin Kruger and David Dunning of Cornell University. It's about seven pages, single space, kind of uh, dense, but, but what they found out and what John Cleese was talking about was that if you look at any one field, math, English, whatever, I mean, they, they used math and English because they were testing college students, the great American guinea pig, and uh, if you take any one field and you look at how good someone is in, across the spectrum from can't add one and one to Einstein, there, there's the middle where you know you're okay at it, and if you teach me, I'll get better. There, there's the top where you know, you, you know you're really good at it, but there's always something more to explore. But there's this section down at the bottom where you can be so bad at something that you don't know how bad you are. And they, they tested this. There are groups of people that if you, they would bring people in and they'd say, we're going to give you a test and we're going to give you some coaching and teaching and see if you get better. The people in the middle, they'd get a little bit better. The people near the, the top, they actually got a lot better because they knew how much they really understood the field. But there are people who are so clueless that they didn't benefit from the teaching because they didn't think they needed it. And I thought of that as I read Proverbs. Here at the, Prover at the beginning of the Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Knowing that you're not God, knowing that you don't know everything, that's the beginning of knowing anything. To admit you're not, that's the beginning of knowing anything, is to admit you're not God. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And I thought, that, that's about right. There are people who can be so foolish that they won't even take instruction because they don't think they need it. And so Proverbs responds to this, and it responds a little bit, it reads a bit differently than that study from Cornell, but its response is, is the same. Seek wisdom and instruction. Don't be a fool. Only a fool denies that there is still much, much to learn. And so then the book of Proverbs goes on to give us a choice. How will you, what choice will you make in, in life? Will you choose to seek instruction or, or, or not? And it presents this choice between two women. I should add as a side note, Proverbs was written for the instruction of young men. And so what are young men usually attracted to? To women. And so if you, those of us who are not attracted to women, if you want to hear instead of wise uh, lady wisdom, you want to hear wise man, that's entirely, that's a fine way to read the Bible, but just let's, that's why it's presented the way it is. But uh, this is written to, to train young men, and they are given this choice. You can choose to follow lady wisdom, or you can choose to follow the temptress. You can choose to follow the one who will give you easy pleasure, instant gratification. We just read a minute ago the description of Lady Wisdom who shouts in the street, lifts her voice, and cries out, How long will you love being simple-minded? Turn to my discipline, turn to my reproof, turn to my teaching, and I will pour my spirit upon you. I will make my words known to you. That's one choice. You can choose to follow Lady Wisdom, choose to accept correction, choose to accept discipline, or you can choose the other lady that's described as follows. My son, be attentive to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a loose woman, loose woman 
drip honey. Her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to hell. She does not take heed to the path of life. Her ways wander. She does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. and Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of the alien. And at the end of, you, at the end of your life you groan, how I hated discipline. A little bit later, it further adds, Do not desire her beauty in your heart, and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For a harlot may be hired for a loaf of bread, but an adulteress stalks a, very man, a man's very life. Can a man carry fire in his lap without being burned? Isn't that a great mental image? <laughs> Carrying fire in your lap. Take that how you will. And so this is the choice that Proverbs ask. It, it asks. It says, seek discipline, seek wisdom. Don't be the fool. Seek lady wisdom. Do not seek the instant gratification of the temptress. And this is one of those decisions that it feels very adult and very responsible to say, yes, I will pick discipline because I am a mature and responsible. Okay, let's be realistic. Who here says, I want to be disciplined, right? That, that's not something you get up and say, you know, I'm excited today. I'm going to get really well disciplined today. No, we live in a day and age that really exalts instant gratification. And if you click on something in Amazon, you got it two days later. And not, there's not much Amazon doesn't carry. And so we are in a time and place when instant gratification is easy. And to turn away from the temptress and the instant gratification to embrace discipline, well, that's, that's challenging. Because discipline, let's admit it, that's kind of a buzzkill of a word. Because you start talking about discipline and what do you think of? Spanking children, right? That, that, that's what we think of. We think about discipline. We're, we think about kids screaming in Walmart. That's what I think of. Kid, th kids screaming in Walmart. And, and, and we think of, of, of all the challenges when they just won't keep the cup up. This, this, uh, Sophia's learning to use a cup still. Um, and the thing about discipline is we have a very narrow view of the word, though. We have this idea that discipline is for children. And, and yes, discipline is for children, but let's not forget why we discipline. We discipline to move towards a goal. Right? We discipline so that we get them towards a goal, and that goal usually is out of the house and employed and insured. I mean, that kind of car. I mean, there's some other things too, but we discipline so that children will grow up and they will mature. And then once this happens, you get out of the house. Once, do you stop having goals? Once you've, once you've hit your goal of getting out of the house, did you stop having goals? No. You had bigger goals, right? Once I, once I was out of my parents' discipline, I had a different goal from that point. It was not to get out of the parents' house. Then my goal was to get through college, to figure out what I'm going to do with my life, to be able to afford a car. I mean, the, the goals get bigger, and discipline, the need for discipline doesn't go away. Because if I'm going to seek those goals in the same way that my parents sought the goal of raising me, if I go about it in an undisciplined way, it's going to be about as ugly as a kid screaming in Walmart. It's just not going to go very far. So, so discipline is something that, that we do need to seek. And I think we need to seek it, especially in the context that we're... In, in this context, in the context of church, because we are here to follow Jesus. And what do you call someone who follows Jesus? Disciple, right? And what's the root word? Disciple, discipline, do you hear it? Same thing. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be disciplined by who Jesus is. To be disciplined, to follow him, to submit ourselves to his teaching. This, it used to be that we practiced this a little bit more obviously, that we practiced as a church. We had a way that people were discipled and disciplined. And what we used to do in the church is we used to have godparents. Who here has godparents? Yeah, it's not kind of, it doesn't happen as often anymore. But the old church tradition is your, your parents were raising you to, to be able to use the toilet, dress yourself study. It's all that, those minor details. But then your godparents were the ones who were responsible for the disciplining of you as a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
And, and that has faded over the last generations. And we've replaced it with uh, baptismal sponsors, but that just isn't really the same, is it? It doesn't, doesn't really catch. It really doesn't change much. And so, if we were wondering today, how do we seek discipline today? How do we in the Milan Methodist Church seek discipline to, be, to grow as disciples of Jesus? To, to be like the Lady Wisdom calls out, to be people who seek to, to be formed as disciples. Well, there are a lot of ways to answer that. It's a fairly hard question. I'll give you one answer today, and uh, it's something I'm hearing more and more about across all parts of my life. I, I hear more and more about the idea of mentoring. Who here would say you have a mentor? Someone who has formed you and taught you. We, we have mentors, right? We, we hear about mentoring. Sometimes we call it coaching. But mentoring is the idea that one person who is farther along sits down with someone who's just beginning and says, I'll, I'll give you a hand. And you sit down, you work out together so that the person who, who is just sort of coming up in that field can, can learn and, 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 to, and grow. And uh, this is something that is how we as a church can love each other because it is not something I wish I could mentor each and every one of you. It's, I'd like to sleep too. I mean, mentoring it, it, it is something that's a one-on-one -on -one relationship and the best a pastor can do is to equip you to do it for each other. You can mentor maybe one or two people at a time and that, that one person is probably about enough. And so... Mentoring is a way that we look around and say, you know what? I need to know how to raise my kids to know Jesus. Who here figured that out? Let me go and sit down and drink coffee with them once a month. Who here knows how to pray? Really knows how to pray? You know, you need to sit down and have, this co have coffee and ask, can I learn from you? Can you be my mentor in this? Can we take a year? Two or five years, whatever. You sit down and say, I need to learn from you how to pray. And you know what? If you came to me and said right now, Andy, I need to learn how to pray, I would say, let's have coffee and then I'm going to send you over to Joanne Holland. She has been leading the prayer chain for a long time and she is a woman of prayer. And if you came to me and said, you know what, Andy, I need to learn, I need, I need to learn how to lead a Bible study, how to study the Bible and to teach others. I would say, you know what, I'll tell you a little bit, but if you need a mentor, you need, you need more than just a half hour conversation, I'm going to send you up to Rama. She has been leading a Bible study Thursdays for decades. Or send over to Marianne, who's been leading a Bible study over here for a good long while. And you can sit down and just sit at that person's feet and, and be mentored by that, that, by that person. And, and the mentor doesn't have to be younger or older, it just has to be someone who is better at something than you are. Sit at their feet and say, teach me. Help me understand. Help me grow in this. And so whether it's being able to serve or being able to lead, being able to pray, being able to study the scripture, being able to raise a kid, being able to be a, a better son, a better a family member, whether it's just following Jesus at all, I need someone to help me wrap my mind around this. If you need to do this, look around, and there's someone in this church or someone in one of the churches in this community who can do this. And you might think to yourself, I don't think I need a mentor. Let me, remind, let me remind you of that study I talked about at the beginning of this. The second you think you've got it all figured out, that is the point that you are most at risk at being completely clueless. We all need mentors. We all need people to, to lead us, to shape us, to help us grow in our faith. And, and to be a mentor, I mean, there are some aspects of, of doing this well. If you get on Google and just put, put in, how do I mentor someone? There are just re resources for days if you want to take a look. But you'll find things like the importance of listening. Listen more than you talk. Uh, ask don't ask a lot of questions. Ask open-ended ones, though. Be a sounding board. Don't tell someone to do what to do. Don't offer advice until asked. Mentoring is not meant to be me making you into a mini-me. Mentoring is me helping you become who you are, right? And so, mentoring it, it, it respects both people involved. But as I said, when you start mentoring with someone, if you need some help setting that up, come talk to me and we'll see what we, what we can get figured. 
This is not something that we do often. It's not something that comes naturally. It's not something that comes easily. It, it does say, seek wisdom. Wisdom is something you have to seek. Discipline is something you have to seek. Because most of us are grown up and no, no one's going to walk in my door tomorrow and tell me, Andy, I'm here to discipline you. I hope not. Uh, <laughs> if I'm going to find discipline, I'm going to have to go find it. I'm going to have to go find someone I respect and love, and it might go out of, you might have to go out of your way to do it. I'm driving to Columbia tomorrow morning to meet with someone to help me with my preaching. If I am any better at preaching over the last year, it is because I sought out some people to discipline me. That's why they're looking at it right now on YouTube. They'll, they'll be looking at this later and telling me about my preaching. I had to seek that out, and it's been worth it. And at the end of Proverbs, it tells us why it is worth it to seek out discipline. At the end of Proverbs, it, the beginning of Proverbs starts with Lady Wisdom. The end of Proverbs ends with Proverbs 31. This is the goal that we're going towards. Again, remembering that this is written towards young men, so this is a description of the, 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 a woman. You can flip this, as I said. But it's, at the end of Proverbs, it describes the result of a life of discipline. It says, A good woman is hard to find and worth far more than diamonds. Her husband trusts her without reserve and never has reason to regret it. Never spiteful. She treats him generously all her life long. She senses the worth of her work, is in no hurry to call it quits for the day. She is skilled in crafts of harm and hearth, diligent in homemaking. She's quick to assist anyone in need reaches out to help the poor. She doesn't worry about her family when it snows. The winter clothes are all mended and ready to wear. Her husband is greatly respected when he deliberates with the city fathers. Her clothes are well made and elegant, and she always faces tomorrow with a smile. When she speaks, she has something worthwhile to say, and she always says it kindly. She keeps an eye on everyone in her household and keeps them busy and productive. Her children respect and bless her. Her husband joins in with words of praise. Many women have done wonderful things, but you've outclassed them all. Charm can mislead. Beauty soon fades. The woman to be admired and praised is the woman who lives in the fear of God, in wisdom. Give her everything she desires. Festoon her life with praises. That's what we're going towards. If you want that to be said of you at the end of your life, the way to do it is to seek discipline today. Go forth, seek and find mentors who can teach you to be better than you are, and then be willing to mentor those who come to you and ask the same. Amen.